Hi, everybody. This is James Tompkins, and welcome to Lecture 10 of the International Finance Series. So I'm going to do what I normally do, and that is to put in perspective why I'm doing what we're doing. And the overall theme of this class, international financial principles as it affects firm value. And value is a function of what two things? Risk and return, right? And so what element of risk have we been looking at? that one might associate with international finance. Exchange rate risk, right? So we've been looking at getting a solid understanding of why the dollar goes up and down in value. And we've also looked at other currencies, sort of used the dollar, if you will, as a, a platform from which, from with which to look at other currencies. And the second half of this class, we're going to be looking at managing this risk, not only in the short run, but also the long run. And by the way, not just managing this risk, but taking advantage, if you will, of risk opportunities that exist out there. And so today's lecture about the foreign exchange markets, I sort of think of, if you will, as a sandwich lecture, because this is not about understanding this risk anymore, and it's not about managing this risk. However, there are some uh, tools, if you will, or there's some markets that we're going to use that are foreign exchange markets that exist out there with which we use or that will apply to manage this risk in the short term. And so, so that's, that's why we're looking at what we're looking at today. In other words, what we learn today in the next lecture we'll be applying to manage exchange rate risk in the short term. So I'll start off with an agenda. And that is, first of all, a general description of the foreign exchange market. We'll get into you know, what it is and why does it exist. And we'll look at some characteristics, for example. How, how big is it? Who does it include? And so on and so forth. And then we'll get into four specific kinds of markets that, are, that uh, exist within the foreign exchange market. One is the spot market. Another is the forward market. Another is the futures market. And then finally, the option market. And, and by the way, um, I don't know if any of you have ever taken a, a futures and options class or, or a derivative securities class or anything like that. But my goal is not going to be to get into valuation of options or futures, etc. That's a much more, uh, if you will, intensive class. However, what I will do is give you enough understanding of what these markets are, such that in the next lecture, when we start applying these markets, it'll it'll make sense. You, you'll understand what the markets do, and and then next week will or next lecture will focus on their application. So so that's essentially my my goal in discussing, you know, futures markets and options markets. Just just enough to help you understand how to apply it. So. With that in mind, you know, what, what is the foreign exchange market? Well, what happens at a marketplace? You buy and sell stuff, right? So when I go to Publix, I say, hey, here's five bucks, give me my broccoli. Is that a Publix place? I mean, is that a marketplace? It is, right? So at a market, you buy and sell stuff. So what do you think you're buying and selling at a foreign exchange market? currency, right? And so basically, on the surface, you could say that foreign ex the foreign exchange market is a place where currency is traded. But let's say I take, you know, a dollar thirty and, and I buy a euro, okay? What, what, what does that euro ultimately do for me? I mean, I know I could tr probably trade it. I mean, I couldn't probably. I could trade it back into a dollar. I could, you know, buy some Swiss francs with it or, or whatever. But, but ultimately, so let's say I'm not using it to, to, to trade into yet another currency. If I have a euro, what, what can a euro do for me? Well, it might be stuff, right? Stuff in Europe. Maybe it buys me a cup of coffee or whatever. So the bottom line is what the currency ultimately gets you. Is it fair to say that? You're essentially buying purchasing power. You are right. You know, basically purchasing power in different countries. And so, when you think about 
what the foreign exchange market is. Really, you, you could think of it as a whole market where you're exchanging purchasing power among different countries. So let me ask you this. Well, why does the foreign exchange market exist? Well, why does money exist? And yeah, let's forget about the foreign exchange market. So imagine that you're in my class and we're in the United States, but money did not exist. Dollars did not exist. Okay. Well, what would we be forced to do every semester if dollars did not exist, if money did not exist? Well, we'd be forced to barter, right? I mean, I'd have to say, all right, well, John, you know, you're an accountant, so you, know, you do my taxes for me, and, and, and I'll teach you finance. And, uh, and, and, and Mary, you, you, um, uh, you know how to cut hair, all right? And so you cut my hair, and I'll teach you finance. And, and, and would, would, that be, uh, would that be an expensive, or what would that do to the cost of doing business? It would increase it, right? I mean, that, that, that'd be a very expensive thing to do. I mean, I, I remember, uh, and, and I'm sure I don't have the exact details correct, okay? But I remember when I worked for FMC, okay, that they got some kind of order from Turkey. Maybe it was, this is years ago, maybe it was uh, torpedo tubes or something like that. That sort of rings, rings a bell. And so, typically, what one would do is FMC would say to Turkey, all right, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make the torpedo tubes for you, right? And then Turkey would pay FMC. Except, you know, FMC did not want the Turkish lira. And apparently, at the time, Turkish lira was just not easily tradable on the foreign exchange market. So it made it very difficult. In fact, it wasn't that long ago that I was in Turkey and I was just visiting there with, with, with my family and we went into Turkey and, and I traded just for the day and I traded euros into lira and then on the way out, guess what? Do you think that they were interested in converting the Turkish lira back to euros? They weren't. And even when I got back into Europe and I tried to go to a bank and exchange the lira back into euros, would they take it? They wouldn't, right? And so, so basically, you know, what had to happen? Well, you know, Turkey couldn't just pay FMC directly. Well, FMC had operations in Brazil. And so Brazil had something that Turkey wanted. I, I, again, I don't remember the detail. Maybe it was some sort of materials and so on and so forth. And then... Brazil engaged in services or whatever for FMC. And I, I know I'm being very vague, but this was roughly the structure of this whole deal. And so my question is, for something like that to happen, would that only happen with a, a deal that was big or, or would it be worth incurring all of those costs for something that was just small? Only for something that was big, right? And so, so money is actually a, a huge, huge way to um, reduce the cost of business. This is not just some sort of classroomish debate or, or whatever. It's huge, the fact that money exists. I mean, I, I, I don't know if anybody's an Ayn Rand fan or ever uh, read Atlas Shrugged, but there's, you can go on YouTube and you can do a search for you know, the money speech and Atlas Shrugged. And there's about a 10 minute monologue on there. And basically this guy's at a cocktail party and some lady says something about money being the root of all evil. And he goes into a 10 minute monologue. Maybe it's more than what you'd want to listen to, but he goes into a 10 minute monologue on uh, how money actually is is amazing as, as far as practicality. And the line that I remember the most from it is that, or, or that struck me the most, is that money enables, enables, for example, me to provide the best of what I have to offer 
in exchange for the best of what you have to offer. And so from that perspective, if we now look at money on a global basis, and we look at the foreign exchange markets, then would you say it, it makes international trade uh, much more likely and a, lot, and a lot easier because it significantly reduces the cost of business? It does, right? So when you think of why the foreign exchange market exists, you know, one way to think about it is that, hey, you know, it, it exists to facilitate international trade. So, so that's, that's a thought process. You know, so, so what is it? Well, ultimately, it's, it's an exchange of purchasing power among countries. And, and why does it exist? Well, it greatly facilitates international trade. So let's look at some other characteristics. Okay, we, we've already talked in previous lectures about, you know, exchange rate communication when we talked about the wholesale market and the retail market. And, and what we're going to do is we're, we're going to be discussing some characteristics at the wholesale market level. So first of all, how big is it? All right, so let me ask you this. Suppose that um, a, a, a hundred yen is, or say 150 yen is converted into one euro. Let's say that's the exchange rate. Now, does there exist a dollar equivalent to that? That does, right? Maybe that's about a dollar twenty. So here's my question. If you took all the exchange that was traded one day at the wholesale level, okay, so um, uh, so euros into yen, and, and yen into dollars, and, and pounds into Swiss francs, and, and, and took the dollar equivalent, okay, what do you think the average amount would be that was traded on a daily basis? Would it be in the billions, maybe? The trillions? Well, this information comes out every three years. Okay, it's put out by the Bank of International Settlements. And so basically what we see here, I go all the way back to 86, so you can see, you know, get some sort of a benchmark. So back then it was a, a quarter of a trillion. And, and now, and these are three-year averages, okay? And, and now the, the latest one is 5.3 trillion. You know, that, that's daily, okay? So, so in other words, th this number here would represent an average of the previous three years. And so... I put there on the slide that it's huge, yeah, and I guess that's a matter of opinion. Some, some of you might say, yeah, that's huge, and, and others, you know, it, it's, it's tiny. Um, but it's certainly growing, right? W with one exception, you know, it looks like uh, in 1998, so the average from 95 to 98, 1.4 trillion, and then, you know, from 99 through 01, it goes down to 1.2 trillion. We'll discuss that in a minute. But, but first of all, why do you think it's so large? If you do agree it's large, or why do you think it's this amount? If, if you want me to ask it in a, in a less biased way. Well, we'll think about it, right? We just said just now that why does it exist? Why does the foreign exchange market exist? To facilitate what? International trade, right? And so... Does that mean that as international trade has increased, that you need more money out there to enable that trade? I mean, think about it this way, right? Imagine that um, this is stuff that's being exchanged. Well, to facilitate this stuff being exchanged throughout the world, do you need money to help that happen? You do, right? And so as, as more and more stuff gets traded, right? So here, here, here are my glasses, my reading glasses, and, and now that there's more stuff being traded. Do, do, do you need more money to, to make that, to help that happen? You do, right? You, you need more money to, to help that happen. And so would it make sense that as the world has become more and more global, and there's been more and more international trade, that you would expect the foreign exchange market to increase or decrease? Increase, right? So it really doesn't surprise us that, that these numbers have gone up, okay? Now, 
why do you think it's growing? Well, you could make the same argument, right? But would you say that we've become increasingly global economically and with our trade or, or, or less increasingly, right? I mean, think about Walmart's whole business plan, right? That they've been, you know, bringing in stuff from China, and 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 certainly, I I think that the perception is that, and and the reality is that the world is becoming increasingly economically integrated, or less increasingly, right? Which makes sense, right? If you go back to I think it was lecture two with our free trade lecture, that makes sense if free trade ceteris paribus, you'd expect it to, on average, increase or decrease a country's standard of living. Well, based on what we discussed there, and you, you can look at the pros and cons and so on and so forth, if you want to go back to that lecture, it would make sense that trade would happen if it were a win-win situation, and, and we related that to a country's standard of living. Now, why do you think it went down in 2001, right? Because we have 1.4 trillion there and then 1.2 trillion there. Why do you think it went down? Well, some of you might say, well, what about September 11th, 2001, when we had the terrorist attacks, right? And so there you have a major risk-increasing event. So let, let's, let's discuss that a second. You know, major risk-increasing event. So what happened to the overall level of the stock market? Did it go up or go down? It went down, right? Let, let's let's think about that. You know, when when you have a major risk increasing event, do investors require higher returns or lower returns? They require higher returns, right? And so, under what circumstance are you more likely to expect a higher return when when you buy something low, or when you buy it high? Well, presumably when you buy it low, right? And so therefore, stock prices, when we had that major risk increasing event, stock prices had to come down low enough, if you will, to bribe people into being willing to buy whatever stock it was at that lower price. So that explains you know, the price direction. But do you think that there was a lot of heavy trading when we had that big risk increasing event? There was, right? Everybody was going, oh, I, I got to sell my stuff. I got to sell my stuff. And eventually when it went low enough, somebody was willing to buy it. And then they bought the stuff. So that would suggest more trading or less trading? More trading, right? And so, so, the, and, and so here we're seeing more trading or less trading? We're seeing less trading, right? That, by the way, does the same logic apply to any risk of changing event? So if we had a, a risk uh, decreasing event, okay? So for example, um, or, or I should say I, I maybe a, a happy face. I don't mean risk de uh, decreasing event. I mean a big risk increasing event, but it's good, good news. Okay, so happy face risk. So for example, when Apple said, you know what? We're going to get into the iPhone business. Okay, when they announced that, what happened to the stock price? It went up, right? And and so it was a they were certainly taking on more risk, right? Because it was a brand new market for them and so on and so forth. Um, but the market had a lot of confidence in Apple being to tackle that. And so when the when the market had all that optimism, was that an incentive for people to buy stock? It was, right? So there's a lot of heavy trading. So any risk, any significant risk changing, whether it's uh, risk changing in, in an increasing direction or risk changing in a decreasing direction, you'd expect to promote more trading activity. And, and here we see, see less trading activity. So can you think of any re other reason why it might have gone down? Well, one reason is the euro, right? I mean, the euro came out in, in January of 1999. And so now, whereas before in the 1998 number, that would capture French francs being converted into Swiss francs and Swiss francs being converted into Belgian francs and Italian lira being converted into Spanish pesetas, all that, as soon as the euro came out, did all that go away? It did, right? And so that's why, that's a, a significant reason as to why it will have declined in 2001. So let's look at some other characteristics.
Who are some of the big players in the wholesale market? Can you think of any? Well, what about, say, large commercial banks, right? Foreign exchange dealers. Or what about brokers? And what's the difference between a dealer and a broker? Well, I'll say this, a little risque, but maybe it'll help you remember it, but does a drug dealer own his or her drugs? They do, right? Okay, so a dealer owns their inventory, but a broker basically figures out, hey, you know, party A wants dollars and, and party B uh, wants yen and is willing to give up dollars and, you know, and these guys are willing to give up yen and so let's, let's put them together and work out a deal, right? Can you think of any other big players? Well, what about multinational corporations? Any other kind of banks you can think of? So we've got large commercial banks. Any other types of banks? What about central banks, right? So those are some of the big players. So let's talk about how, say, dealers make money. Okay? Now, deep insight. You make money by what? Buying low, selling high, or buying high and selling low? Buying low and selling high, right? So, so basically, dealers, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll quote a bid our spread, okay? And so they make their money by, you know, having that spread be su such that they're buying low and selling high. So, so with a bid, are they buying or selling? Well, what happens when you go to an auction and you bid on something? You're buying or selling? You're buying, right? So the bid they're buying and, and, and the ask they're, sale, they're, they're selling. So for example, a bid, you know, what they'll pay for currency. So they'll, they'll buy Danish krona. So let's say you have a Danish krona dealer, right? Well, my bid is what I'll buy for it. So in this case, they're willing to buy Danish krona for $0.17188. And they're ask, okay, hey, you know, I, I have an inventory of, of Danish krona and and if, if you want to buy them from me, it'll cost you $0.172. So in other words, they're buying the krona for less dollars than they're selling. And that's, of course, how they make the money. So they buy low, they sell high, which means the bid is the low or the high. The bid's the low, right? That's what they're buying for. Now, sometimes they'll communicate a bid-ask percentage spread, okay, and so, I'll, I'll ask you this real quick, okay? Let's say that you've got $100, and um, let's say it grows into $110, okay? So, you got $100, and it grows into $110. So, by what percentage did it change? 10%, right? And, and when you calculated that, you took the 110, that's the high, minus the 100, that's the low, and you divide it by the low. Divide it by 100, right? And so here's my question for you. When a dealer quotes a bid-ask percentage spread, do they do it the way you used to? High minus low over low, that'd be the equivalent of the 110 minus the 100 divided by the 100? Or do they do a high minus low over high? No, it's 110 minus 100 divided by 110. Well, I guess we could get into a little bit of a, you know, student teacher psychology here or whatever, but why would I bring it up if it wasn't something different? And so sure enough, it, it is what you would not expect, high minus low over high. And so the way they, they calculate this is, you know, the, which is the high, the ask or the bid? The ask, right? So ask minus bid over ask. So in our example, using the numbers that I brought up earlier with the Danish krona, here's the ask, here's the bid, there's the ask, and should be about 1-2%. So any thoughts? Why do you think they divide by the high, not the low price? Well, the bigger this bid-ask percentage spread, does that mean that, if you will, they're charging more for their service or less? They're charging more, right? And so, you know, one thought, and I'm about to, uh, you know, 
play devil's advocate for this thought, but one, one thought is when they divide it by this, this higher number, does it make their price seem bigger or smaller? Makes it seem smaller, right? And so that would be, I guess, a good thing, right? If you can make your price appear to be smaller. But can you think of a counter-argument to this? Well, do you think the market would be fooled by this? Do you think the market cannot figure out that, hey, you know, you divide it by the ask and, you know, I mean, is the market that dumb? The, the more efficient the market is, is, are they more likely to be fooled or less likely to be fooled? Less likely, right? And when you look at how big this market is, right, especially for the harder currencies, would you expect these the, the, these currencies would be highly, highly, highly efficiently priced or, or less efficiently? Highly efficiently, right? So in, in any case, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure why they divide it by, by the ask, uh, but you know, it, it is what it is. You know, that, that's how it's communicated. So let me ask you something a little bit more conceptual and less definitional. Let's say you've got two dealers. You've got a Mexican peso dealer, and you've got a European euro dealer. Okay, so which one do you think would have a higher bid-ask percentage spread, the peso dealer or the euro dealer? Well, which one? Remember, they—they they, or I'll ask you the dealers. Do they own the inventory? So, does a peso dealer have an inventory of pesos? He or she does, right? And does the euro dealer own? An inventory of euros? They do, right? So, do you think both these currencies are equally volatile or equally risky? Presumably they're not, right? Which one do you think is the riskier currency? Well, I'm guessing the peso. And, and assuming the peso is the riskier or the more volatile currency, then a dealer who owns this more volatile stash of pesos, would, 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 they, would they require higher returns? Would they have to be more rewarded or would they require lower returns? Higher returns, right? Which would suggest they would have a higher or lower percentage bid ask spread, the peso dealer. Higher. Now what kind of um, risk do foreign exchange dealers face? Well, yeah, of course, there's exchange risk, right? Because they, they hold that inventory. But we'll see in the next lecture how they can, can manage that risk. But they also make credit risk. Because with some of these markets, what happens is you make a deal today, but you don't do the actual exchange until sometime in the future. But if sometime in the future, your counterparty goes bankrupt, or they can't pay you or whatever, what do we call that? We call that credit risk. So some more characteristics, you know, where and how does trading take place? So do you think that most of the foreign exchange is traded in a centralized place? Like for example, the New York Stock Exchange, right? That's a centralized place where stock is traded. Do you think that's the case for most of the foreign exchange markets? Or do you think that most trading is done over a, a wide variety of computers throughout the world and is decentralized. Well, most of it's decentralized, okay? And, uh, and obviously, since the internet has emerged, there's various trading platforms out there. And, and by the way, not just for the wholesalers, okay? E even individual investors. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not one to give investment advice, but I, I would at least wait or at least look at the next... Uh, lecture that we have on managing this risk before you decide as an individual investor to start speculating uh, in the uh, foreign exchange market. But that's, that's an aside. In any case, currencies are traded in four main markets. We've got the spot market, the forward market, the futures market, and the options market, or at least those are the four markets I'll discuss. So let's start talking about the spot market. I'll start off with an agenda, and that is, you know, we'll, we'll define it, we'll get into a description. Then we'll do something called cross-rate example or calculations. So, so what is the spot market? 
well. Um, it's basically trading on the spot. You know, it's for immediate delivery. It's like, all right, hey, you know, here's a dollar. Now give me, uh, give me a hundred yen. Okay. Now in the wholesale market, in, in practice, okay, it might be that maybe there's a, a business day delay or something like that, but that's still considered the spot market. So that's what it is. What's a cross rate? Is that like, wow, I can't believe I got such a lousy exchange rate. Well, it, it's almost, I don't want to say arrogant, but it, it's almost, um, well, the thing is that when exchange rates are communicated, typically there's a dollar in, in, in the numerator or the denominator. Okay, so for example, it might be you know, yen per dollar or, or dollars per euro. <laughs> so you might have something like that. Okay, so in both cases, there's dollars involved. Okay, well, a cross rate is uh, when there is no when there is no dollar involved. Okay, so this this yen per euro. Okay, that would be a cross rate when you don't see a dollar on top or on the bottom. So let's go through an example. Okay, and this is from an actual you know, Wall Street Journal. Uh, example. So knowing the dollar quotes on the pound and the euro, what is the pound per euro cross rate? Okay, so if I look at you know, a Wall Street, you know, recent Wall Street Journal example right, right here, okay, I'm using these two numbers right there that you can see on the screen. So we've got that the, the, the rates where the dollars are included is, is $1.3934 dollars per euro and 1.6593 dollars per pound and the question is well what, what is this what's the pound per euro cross rate now the approach is simply to make the units match so for example if I'm looking for pounds per euros is that pounds per dollars times dollars per euro it is right because the do the dollars cancel does this bottom dollar cancel with that top dollar it does, right? And when these dollars cancel, I'm left with pounds per euro. So if we look at the, the two numbers, you know, we've got dollars per euro, that, so we don't have to do anything with that. But we've got dollars per pound. Is that what we wanted? Take a look at the previous slide. Did we want dollars per pound or pounds per dollar? We wanted pounds per dollar, right? So, so what do we have to do this guy to, to turn that into pounds per dollar? Well, we have to take the reciprocal, right? So that's 1 divided by that. And so, and so now, when we take 1 divided by the 1.65, etc., we get pounds per dollar. So now the cross rate is just, you know, multiplying them. And there's the cross rate. Now, if I take you to the Wall Street Journal again, the same article, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, but, but this number right here, okay, that is exactly the number that we just calculated with these calculations. So here, here's my question for you. Did the Wall Street Journal, when they came out with this 0.8398 pounds per euro, is that how they got the number? Did they go through the calculations that we went through? Well, they, they didn't, okay? The, the, what the Wall Street Journal is, is, uh, is quoting you, that this 0.8398 pounds pure, that is the actual market price. In other words, on, in, on the wholesale market, it took 0.8398 pounds to buy a euro. So my question is, well, what kind of opportunity would have existed if the number that we got was different from what was in the Wall Street Journal. That'd be an arbitrage opportunity, right? And so the fact that when we went through the calculations and to four digits got exactly what was published in the Wall Street Journal, 
that would suggest that, at least with these harder currencies, that they're highly, highly efficiently traded or they're inefficiently priced. That they're highly efficiently priced, right? So let's do a slightly more complicated one. Okay? Suppose the spot quote rate on the Swiss franc and Mexican peso are 0.6410-15 and for the peso 0 0.1036-40. And the question is, what is the direct home, which is home on top and foreign on the bottom, spot bid ask quote for the Mexican peso in Switzerland? So in other words, you're a peso dealer and you live in Switzerland. Okay. Well, first of all, you know, when stuff is communicated like this, 0.6410-15, and that's how they communicate. I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult, but what does that mean? Well, what it means is that you see this, this, this one zero here? It's actually a shortcut way of communicating two prices. Okay, this is communicating 0 0.6410 dollars per Swiss franc is one price, and 0.64, instead of this 10 that's replaced by the 15, 0.6415 dollars per Swiss franc. So if I, if I write down those two numbers, okay, give me a second, 0 0.6410 dollars per Swiss franc, and 0.6415 dollars per Swiss franc. Okay, that's that's essentially what this is communicating. What, what what do you think those two numbers represent? Well, how does a dealer make his or her money? Well, they buy low and they sell high, right? And what do we call the the high and the low? The ask and the bid, right? So, so basically, you know, this, the 0.6410, that's the low, that's the bid. So how much a, a, a dealer, okay, will, 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 uh, is willing to buy a Swiss franc, okay? And 0.6415 is the ask how much they're willing to swallow a Swiss, Swiss franc for, okay? Um, so, by the way, of course, notice that the dealer is buying low and selling high. So, is it fair to say the dealer always gets the best deal? It is, right? That's how they make their living. Okay, so now we know what these, these numbers mean. The next thing is, the question said, well, they, they want a direct quote. Okay, so direct quote is the home currency on top and the foreign currency on the bottom. So, you're in Switzerland, so what's the currency in Switzerland? Swiss francs, right? And you're a peso dealer. So, so basically, the unit's going to be Swiss francs per peso. Okay, the next question is, well, all right, they want the bid ask. So, so we'll work on the bid. And then at the end, I'll give you the answer for the ask. And, and you can go through the, the same thought process and, and see if you can figure out the ask. Okay? So you're a peso dealer. And, and you're bidding. Okay, does that mean you're buying pesos or selling pesos? Well, you're buying pesos, right? But you're in Switzerland, so what are you buying pesos with? You're buying pesos with Swiss francs. Okay. So so let's 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 go through a thought process. Yeah, you know, the thing is that we've got basically four numbers, right, to work with, and, and we don't know which four to work with. So there's an approach to figuring this out, okay? So the bid, they're buying pesos with Swiss francs. So if they're buying pesos with Swiss francs, must they already have Swiss francs in the first place? They must, right? And so a thought process, you don't do this in real life. A thought process is, a thought process is all right, well, we have Swiss francs. You know, step one We'll convert them into dollars. Okay, but the question is, well, what do we, what do we use? Okay, so we have Swiss francs, and we'll convert them into dollars. So, does the dealer always get the best deal? They do, right? So, are they going to get a lot of dollars for their Swiss francs, or just a few? 
a lot, right? So, so basically it would be the 0.6415. That would be the number that you would work with with that. So converting the Swiss francs into dollars, they'll get a lot of dollars, so 0.6415. So now they have dollars, and they're going to convert them into pesos. Well, the dealer gets the best deal, right? So does that mean that they'll use a lot of dollars, this 40 here, to get the pesos, or just a few dollars, this 36? Just a few, right? And so the right number is the 0 0.1036. So now, we, we've, you know, we've done the hard part. We've figured out, well, here are four numbers up here. We've figured out the relevant numbers for the bid. So again, the thought process was, well, first of all, what is a bid? Are they, you're a peso dealer, you're bidding. Are you buying pesos or selling pesos? You're buying pesos, right? But you're in Switzerland, so what are you buying pesos with? Swiss francs, right? So does that mean you must already have Swiss francs? It must mean that, right? So a thought process, this doesn't happen in real life. You know, for a peso dealers does not have to convert their stuff into dollars and then convert into Swiss francs. They don't have to do that, okay? But this is just the thought process for figuring out, well, how do we calculate the Swiss franc per peso bit? So they're buying pesos with Swiss francs, which means they must have Swiss francs. So step one, convert it into dollars. Well, are they going to get a lot of dollars or a few dollars? a lot of dollars because they're the dealer. Step two, now they have dollars, convert them into pesos. Well, are they going to need a lot of dollars or just a few dollars to convert into pesos? Just a few because they're the dealer. They get the best deal. And so now that you've identified the right numbers, it's just a question of making the units match. Okay, so we've got dollars per Swiss franc is um, in terms of Swiss francs per dollar, you can take the reciprocal. Mexican pesos, we already have units that we want. Okay, so notice we've got Swiss francs over dollars times dollars over pesos. Do the dollars cancel out? They do, right? And so we're, we're left with Swiss francs per peso. Okay, so um, let me just make that crystal clear. We've got Swiss francs per peso is equal to Swiss francs per dollar multiplied by dollars per peso. Okay, that, that's, that's, this is essentially what we've done right here. Okay, so we needed Swiss francs per peso. Notice that the, the dollars cancel, and so we're left with Swiss francs per peso. So we need our units in Swiss francs per dollars and dollars per peso. So what I'd like you to do, and is, is try this on your own, go through a similar thought process and figure out what the ask is. And I've given you the answer right there, and that will help solidify your understanding for this. So that's the spot market. Well, the next market I want to discuss is the forward market. So what is the forward market? Well, basically, conceptually, you're making a deal today about an exchange in the future. And it's a customized deal. So for example, uh, you might be ABC Corporation and you go to your bank and you'll make a deal with your bank about an exchange, obviously, of currency because we're talking about the foreign exchange market. And you'll make a deal today about an exchange in the future. But, but what things would you have to agree on as far as an exchange in the future? Well, would you have to agree on how much, the amount, I mean, so say 100 million yen or whatever? You would, right? And what else would you have to agree on? Well, when, when is this exchange going to take place, right? Are we talking about three months from now or, you know, 39 days from now or whatever? And what else would you have to agree on today? The exchange rate, right? So basically, the foreign exchange market is where two parties get together. It's, it's an individualized deal. And you make a deal today about an exchange in the future. And so if you go to you know, the Wall Street Journal, again, you can, you can look this stuff, probably, I'm sure, up in different places. But here we have um, 
So the Japanese yen. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see this, but that there's the one month forward, and there's a three month forward, and the six month forward, and these are all prices. And uh, typically, how far in the future do these agreements extend? Well, typically a year. I mean, I, I know the Wall Street Journal only showed one, three, and six, but typically they'll go out as far as a year. Here's another question. Yeah. Are, these, are these agreements made in a centralized location or is it decentralized? It's decentralized, right? I mean, you, just because, I mean, you might look in the Ford, uh, in the Wall Street Journal and, and see these prices and that might make it look like a stock price and stocks are traded and so on and so forth. But actually, that's all survey data. In other words, some company you know, contacted 100 banks or whatever it was and said, hey, this seems to be the average exchange rate at which banks are willing to get into these deals. And so it's a customized deal. It's decentralized. It's a customized deal between a client and a bank. Now, who has access to the forward market? Well, would a bank be willing to do this with a party that was perhaps going to go potentially bankrupt in the next 30 days if we're talking about a 90-day contract? Or, well, let me put it this way. Are they more likely to do it with creditworthy customers or non-creditworthy customers? Creditworthy, right? And then the other thing is that typically these deals need to be for at least a million dollars. So it might be $1.396 or $1.107. So it can be any amount that you want, but typically at least for a million. And so if you're talking about just one contract being for at least a million, are you more likely going to be a large firm or a small firm? A large firm, right? So, so basically what that means is that who has access to the forward market you're talking pragmatically large and creditworthy customers. Now, if you're the bank, what kind of risk does the bank face? Well, we've just said that you know the, those that have access have to be large and creditworthy. But but even if you're dealing with somebody who's creditworthy, do they still face credit risk? Is it possible that the customer will not come through with the deal they made? That's possible, right? So they face credit risk, right? And what about exchange risk? Okay, so, so in other words, the forward rate, uh, you're making a deal today for what the expected exchange rate is going to be down the road. Okay, so at the time that you enter into the deal, you, you don't expect to lose or make money from the deal, but 30 days later, is the exchange rate going to favor one part or the other? It is, right? In other words, is it highly unlikely that the actual exchange rate, if we're talking, let's say we're talking about a, a 30 day forward uh, rate, is it highly unlikely that the actual exchange rate will be what was expected? That'd be very unlikely, right? Which means somebody's going to be happy face and somebody's going to be sad face. And so from that perspective, you could say that the bank also faces exchange risk. However, there's something that the bank can do to either eliminate or greatly reduce this exchange risk. So let me show you what. So here we have ABC Corporation, and they make a deal today that say in 90 days that, uh, hey, yeah, I, I want to give you a million dollars and I want you to give me a hundred million yen. Now, if the bank has another customer that, that wants the exact opposite, okay, hey, you give us a million dollars and we'll give you a hundred million yen, then does the bank care about the unexpected exchange rate movements? They don't, right? They're what's called hedged in this example. We'll talk about that in the next lecture when we talk about managing exchange rate risk. But basically, you know, no matter what the actual exchange rate is, you know, according to this, what is the expected exchange rate? The expected exchange rate is 100, is 100 yen to the dollar, right? And, uh, but the actual exchange rate, maybe it ends up 30 days later, later being 
99 yen to the dollar or 101 yen to the dollar, whatever. But the bank isn't going to face any unexpected happy face or sad face because it can just take this million dollars from ABC and pass it on to XYZ and, and vice versa. And, and, and how does the bank get paid? Well, maybe there's a, an implicit uh, charge or an explicit charge. By implicit, I mean, all right, well, maybe this is a service that they provide to try to retain their best and large customers. So that's how they offset exchange rate risk. But let me be a little bit critical. Okay, it's easy for me to throw this up in the classroom, right? And say, well, yeah, that's how they offset exchange rate risk. But how realistic is it that the bank is going to find another party that exactly wants the equal and opposite for the amount to be traded and exactly 30 days from now? I mean, is that realistic or unrealistic? That's unrealistic, right? But what I'm telling you is that the concept of what I'm showing you there is realistic. So how, how can you reconcile the fact that I agree with you that finding a party that wants something exactly equal and opposite is, is highly unlikely, and yet the concept of what we see here is pragmatic? Well, well let, let me show you. Is, is the bank in the business of you know, doing business with a, with a lot of customers? They are, right? And so, so, so maybe you know, they have deals going on with, with all these different customers. And, and so maybe we've got, for example, the, you know, this guy wants yen and this guy wants dollars and you know, Swiss francs for yen and, and maybe this guy is 30 days and this is 42 days, et cetera, et cetera. And so my question for you is that even if you do not have an exact equal offset, would you expect there to be some, some natural offsets going on? You would, right? And, and people a lot smarter than me can, you know, can write programs and, and figure out, you know, basically this might be, you know, a, a, a billion dollars worth of transactions, but maybe only, you know, a, a million is exposed because there's just a lot of natural offsets. And that million that's exposed, that, that's what's called your net exposure. And, and, and so that, there are ways for the bank to even hedge that. I'll use the term that's, that's applied. And so, so yeah, uh, it, th this picture is highly unrealistic, but the concept of all the different uh, transactions that a bank has going on with its, with its other clients for other forwards, if you will, uh, their net exposure would be relatively smaller. So that's the forward market. Now, what about the futures market? Okay. Can you tell me what the futures market is about? Well, basically, it, it's conceptually exactly the same as the forward market. And what happened in the forward market? Well, you made a deal today about an exchange in the future, right? And, and you had to agree on what items. Do you have to agree on how much? Yeah, the amount to be traded. What else did you have to agree on? The when? What else? And the exchange rate. And it's the same thing here, right? You know, two parties make a deal on exchange in the future. How much? You know, when? And, and the exchange rate which is now called the futures rate. And again, the futures rate, just like the forward rate, is the market saying today, hey, we have an expectation today that the exchange rate in 30 days or whatever will be, say, 100 yen to the dollar. Okay? So the forward market and the futures market are conceptually identical. So then, then what are the differences? Well, with the futures market, you know, the futures are traded just like stock, okay? And, and there is a, a centralized place, for example, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, where these, these financial securities are traded. And so for them to be traded, it means they have to be standardized. People have to understand what they're buying and selling. So in what way can a contract be standardized? 
Well, similar to what we just discussed, right? So, so would one contract have to represent the same amount? It would, right? So you have to know, you know, how much every single piece of paper counts for. And what else? The when. Okay. So for example, you could go to again to the uh, to the Wall Street Journal or whatever, and they, they give you this information. So I'm not sure if you can see that. But here we have Japanese yen. And here you have, some, here this says 12.5 million yen right here. So if you engaged in one futures contract, it would be for 12.5 million yen. And then along the side, they have, uh, they have June and, and September and December. Okay, so these are all dates. And so when you see, for example, June, what does that mean? That means, by convention, the Wall Street Journal doesn't have you know, all the space to add this all in, but the end of the third Friday in June is, is the when, if you will. So, with the forward market, as long as it was at least a million, you could get into a, a contract that was for, uh, you know, say, 23 days, and 105.68 million dollars. In other words, you were confined. Whereas the futures market, well, if I wanted to get a, a, a futures yen contract for 13 million yen instead of 12 and a half million, could I do that? I couldn't, right? I'd be stuck in units of 12 and a half million yen. So I could, I could do it, get one contract for 12 and a half million yen, Two contracts that would represent 25 million yen, but I'd be I'd be stuck with those those the specific units. And and could I get a futures contract for that ex expired, you know, in 19 days or in 27 days? No, I'm stuck with with in that example June, the end of the third Friday in June. So is that convenient or inconvenient relative to the forward market? Well, presumably that's inconvenient. And so then my question is, well, why standardize? Well, let, let's take a look at it, okay? The way, the way it works is that what, what you have to do is when you engage in a futures contract or the second you enter into a futures contract, do, do you already have something that has built-in value? You don't because the 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 exchange that you're agreeing on is the expected exchange rate. So you, you already have built-in profits. So when you, when you engage, this is why I'm using the word engage, when you engage in a futures contract, you are not buying something. You're basically agreeing to something. It's not like, hey, here's five bucks, give me my broccoli. Okay. You, the, the, the instant you enter into it, you have something that has zero value. Okay. However, okay, what you have to do is you have to put up a certain percentage of, of, of the uh, value of the contract or, or the amount that the contract applies to, I should say, and that's called your margin. Okay, so for example, um, let's, say that, uh, let's say that you enter into uh, you know, the, the, the 12 and a half million yen. Let's say that's equivalent to ten thousand dollars okay I'm just making this up let's say twelve and a half million yen is equivalent to ten thousand dollars and so 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 what maybe you know the the margin requirement and, and again I'm making this up maybe the require the margin requirement is ten percent so what that means is that you would have to put up you know a thousand dollars okay so so all right here Chicago Mercantile Exchange Here's a thousand dollars, and now I'm entering into this this yen futures contract. Now that thousand dollars is that a price? Is that is that like hey, here's a thousand bucks, and it no longer belongs to me, but now I have a futures contract, or does that thousand dollars belong to me? That thousand dollars belongs to me. Okay, that that's my margin. That's my money. Okay. Now the very next day, is it possible, or is it likely? that 
well, let's just say the very next day the futures price changes. Okay. So does that mean that the next day I'll, I'll either be holding something where I have a, a built-in paper profit or, or a paper loss? It will, right? Because either futures contract will have, the, the price will have changed in my favor relative to what I've locked in, or it'd be the opposite. And so let's suppose it's the opposite. Let's say the very next day I've lost on paper the equivalent of, say, $100. Okay, so what will happen, I'm, I'm leaving out a wrinkle that I'll bring you up to speed on in a minute. Okay, what will happen is that I'll, I'll get what's called a margin call. And, and I don't mean literally the phone rings. Yeah, I'm sure there's you know, modern ways of communicating this, but that's what they call it. You, know, you, you get a margin call. And so at the margin call, they would say, all right, well, you can uh, you can either send us another hundred bucks so you bring your your margin back up to a hundred dollars I mean a thousand dollars okay or if you don't want to do that because the futures contract you have because it's tradable then we will simply trade you out of your position and then give you back how much money the whole thousand no, nine hundred dollars, right? Because you lost a hundred, and so that whole process is basically calling is, is called you know daily mark to market. So on a daily basis, they will track your losses, and to be, to be allowed to stay in the futures contract, you keep you you have to maintain your margin at a certain level. Now the only wrinkle I didn't add is that in reality they have something called an initial margin, that's the thousand dollars, for example, and then they have a maintenance margin. So, that, so they'll let that thousand dollars go down to, and again, I'm making this up, say eight hundred bucks, and then you have to at least maintain that eight hundred bucks. And so, if you get that that margin call, if if you do not mark, to, you know, if you do not mark to market, if you do not bring it up, then uh, then you'll uh, they'll trade you out. And that's why these contracts have to be standardized, because if they weren't standardized, would it be pragmatic to trade them? I mean, if they weren't, if, if you had one that expired, for example, every day in June or every day of the year, would there just be hundreds and hundreds of these Japanese yen contracts? There would, right? Which would make them more efficiently priced or less efficiently priced? less efficiently priced. And that's why they have to be standardized, okay, so to allow the trading. And so now, at this point, do I have to be credit worthy? Do I, do I even have to get a credit check? I don't, right, because I put up my margin. And, and every day, they'll make sure that I maintain that margin at a certain level if I'm losing money. So that's how the futures markets work. So how do you know what the exchange rate is in a futures contract? Well, the market decides that, right? In the same way the market is saying, all right, hey, Apple share is now trading for $525. Okay, well, does the market also have an expectation of what an exchange rate is going to be down the road? They do, right? And so that, so that is, the, that is the, the, um, you know, the, the futures rate is the market's expectation. So like I said, the second you engage in a futures contract, do you already have something that has built-in value? You don't. I mean, it's worth zero. The, the microsecond that you enter in the futures contract, it's worth zero. Okay, because you're holding a piece of paper that's saying, well, you've locked in what the market expects. There's nothing built in. But an hour later, you might have lost some money or you might have made some money because the futures price has changed. So that, that's the futures market. There's one more market I want to look at, and that's the options market. So if we look at this definition here, it says an American-style call option gives you the right, but not the obligation. Now here are all the criteria to, to, to buy a pre-agreed amount of currency, so that's how much, on or before a pre-agreed date, that's the when, at a pre-agreed exchange rate. 
So, so let me ask you this. Now you're buying something. Yeah, with an option you are buying. It is like, here's five bucks, give me my broccoli. So with an option, yeah, here, here's some money. Uh, here's, uh, yeah, here's, uh, yeah, here, here's money. And now give me a piece of paper that says, hey, I have the right, but not the obligation. So in other words, options have value. I, I mean, imagine I go to you, all right, hey, <laughs> you know what? You don't have to come to class. You don't have to take these silly tests I give. All right, and and but if you can, if you if you want to, you can come to class. If you want to, you can take the silly tests. Right, but you don't have to. Okay, so you have the right, but not the obligation. And then at the end of the semester, when it comes to me checking off that grade box, I'll check the A for you. Huh? Would that be worth something for you? Huh? Uh huh. Yeah. Well, we can talk, right? So so basically, options have value. And uh, and so that's. That's a, a, an American-style call option. So question for you. What word would I have to change in this definition up here if instead I put in the word put? So instead of call up here, I put in the word put. So an American-style put option, what word would I have to change? Well, this buy would become a sell. So an American-style put option gives the hold of the right, but not the obligation, to sell a pre-agreed amount of currency on or before a pre-agreed date. And what about European style? Okay, and by the way, this, this doesn't have anything to do with where these things are traded. Okay, so it's not, all right, American style call option, American style options are in the United States and European, it's just definitional. So, so if I put a European style, what would I change? I'd get rid of the words uh, or before, so it'd be on a pre-agreed date. So, as I discussed earlier, when I enter into an options contract, does it have value? It does, right? Because I'm not locked in. I have that option value. But, but with futures, the second I enter into it, did it have value? It didn't, right? Because you're locking in an exchange rate that at the time you enter into it is what the market expects. Of course, an hour later, that exchange rate will have changed, what the market expects will have changed, which means you know, either you've locked in something that we've made money or lost money. If we look a little bit more about at the, the options market, uh, traded on centralized exchanges, for example, you know, the Philadelphia uh, options market, okay, and you'll have to stipulate the contract size, so on the Philadelphia, it, it's I don't know why, but it's exactly half of what the futures is. So, so options are traded in units of six and a quarter million yen. Um, of course, expiration date and exercise price. So, so those are those are all things that are stipulated in the options market. And so again, you know, those are the markets. Again, my goal was simply to give you enough knowledge for for what they are, and then in the next lecture. We'll be using some of these markets to manage exchange rate risk in the short term. So once again, I hope this has been a good learning experience and hope to see you at the next lecture. Take care. Bye-bye.